welcome to Pockets of Joy. Today I'm talking to Dublin actor and writer Lauren Larkin about her new short film, One More Round, which deals with a couple's infertility struggles and recently premiered at the Galway Film Fla. Dive into this pocket of joy as we discuss juggling motherhood with our busy careers, the sandwich generation who care for their elderly parents as well as their young children, and we process a bit about the pandemic. Enjoy. How are you? I'm good, I'm good. How are you? Good. I've got my tea. You have your tea as well. Me too. Yay. Do you mind if from time to time I pick this up? It's cross stitch. What I've realized is I find Zoom and video calls and face to face really hard because I have this, it's the autism or ADHD. I have this voice in my head going, smile now, lift your eyebrows now. That's a constant for me. And I've realized that even on this podcast, I have that going on. And I'm actually not listening to the person I'm talking to when I'm conscious of what I look like. Two people ago when I was recording, it was off camera. And I said to her, look, I'm just going to do my cross stitch. And she was like, grand. I heard every word she said. And it made me so much more involved in the conversation. So I'm going to maybe try and do it now on camera, which feels weird because it might look to people watching on YouTube that I'm not listening to you. But it's how I actually need to focus. I've heard, I've heard of that with a lot of people with uh, ADHD that they kind of have to have the few tabs open so that they can nearly hone in. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I need to be doing something. Yeah. So rather than just play with the fidget toy, which does nothing, I'll just be doing just... a little cross stitch. <laughs> Isn't that great that you were able to figure that out? Like, yeah, like I've known it for ages, and it's not socially acceptable not to be looking at you or at the camera. Yeah. But I yeah. find that just causes me no end of anxiety and panic. And then after this call, I would need an hour or two to come down from the high stress that I was feeling the whole time. So this way I'm way more relaxed. So I'm going to start right now. Go um, for it. I know you. How long? I was trying to think how many years is it since we met first? Um, it would be 14 years. You were a tiddler back then. Like 14 years ago, I was 32 and I had a baby. But you were like fresh out of school, basically, weren't you? Yeah, I think I was like 19, 18, maybe 18. And I've just been watching your career grow and grow and grow. You've been in a feature film in the cinema. You've now written your own film, which was just <laughs> a film flat and you've starred in it. Do you want to just tell everybody like you're an actor and writer? Do you want to give a little rundown for people? Yeah, okay. Um, well, I'm an actor and a writer from Dublin. Um, I started yeah, quite young when I was like 18, 19. I'd, already, I'd been in Dublin Youth Theatre. Um, and then from there, I went on to work with a theatre company from when I was about 18 and kind of stayed there and worked there for the next kind of years, all throughout kind of my early 20s. And then I kind of, I left the theatre club, the company I was working with to kind of pursue just to kind of spread my wings a little bit. They were kind of the only company I was working with. I kind of wanted to try different things. And um... You were like Jerry Halliwell leaving the Spice Girls. Because I remember at the time hearing you were leaving and you're the red haired like, and I remember going, yeah. what? Oh my God, what would it be without her? But you did. And I mean, you've gone on to have an amazing career. So yeah. career. <laughs> I, want, I, I suppose I found, I always wanted to be in like plays and films and kind of, um, I loved what I was doing in theatre club but I found I wasn't being seen for anything else or I wasn't being yeah other doors weren't really opening so I was like right I'm gonna have to go and give this a bit of time and investment and just like put all my energy into that yeah so that's what I did I'd also become a mother during that time as well so I think when I had my first child I was quite young and I was like I just, something kind of changed, you know? Loads of moms say that they get way more focused when they have a baby first. They just, yeah. they have no time to waste. They're like, that's in my sights now. I'm going to go for it. Was that like for you? There was like a new fire in my belly, a new kind of ambition. And I just wanted to kind of really explore that and trust that. And also it was an instinct thing. And I do have very strong instincts and very strong gut reaction. So I kind of had to listen to that and honor that. Mm -hmm. and that's what I did so I just kind of tried to make new connections and it's just been kind of evolving and growing since then I don't think you've been stereotyped I think you've played a huge variety of characters as well haven't you like you yeah. can be a real glam like boss babe character 
but then you've also done really gritty hardcore characters who are going through a lot <laughs> thank Aren't you they? and what I love is you've been really ballsy and you have now written so much of your own stuff when did the writing come into it for you and when did you decide I'm not just going to be an actor waiting for the phone to ring well I suppose when I worked with theatre club, there was always an element of being a maker. So we were making theatre together, we were devising. I never felt just a, an actor who was being given something to deliver and inhabit a character or whatever. So I think when I kind of went on the journey to then kind of try to forge my own path within the industry, the first thing I did was um, a play I wrote called Split Ends. And it was part of the uh, an initiative called Show in a Bag. Um, I think Max McAuliffe, who you had on before, she was also part of Show on the Bag as well. And that was like a complete game changer for me um, because I was like the leader of it. I brought in a director, Ashling Bourne, and then myself and herself kind of, I had written a, a good lot of the script and then she would have like dramaturgically come on board and then put, help me piece it all together. And then also uh, she co-wrote it with me as well, you know? Yeah. Um, but the whole idea, concept, the characters, like everything came from me, you know? Yeah. And that was in 2018. And that kind of couldn't have gone any better than I really, than I dreamed of, you know? It was just so brilliant. It was so rewarding. It was so amazing to be doing a show in the Dublin Bridge Festival that was like mine. And I was performing in it and I was after writing it. And yeah, it just felt like a really big, a big moment, a big achievement, you know? I love that. And Ashling was a young, like a young mother as well. So the two of us, we used to call it like two mas make a show because we met up and we would be doing our like sessions where we'd be working on the script or like blocking it out or whatever. And we'd be like on a strict time schedule. There was no going for a cup of tea afterwards. It was literally work home, you know, chats on the phone at night after the kids had gone to bed. But that was great because again, that gave great focus. And it also just... It put a bit of kind of like steam up the two of us to go yeah we were both kind of challenging ourselves artistically there as well you know amazing because so often I mean Mags was saying herself being a mother it can be hard to get back into the industry after having a baby and I've known other actors who've become parents who have found they nearly want to take off the whole of their kids primary school years because it's so intense parenting children of that age so for you that yeah. was cool that you had that opportunity to really get keep being creative yeah, I was also very lucky in it when I had my first child, Robin, in that, like, I had him and we were planning to bring one of our shows on tour to Australia. So he came on tour when he was like three months old with me. And I brought my husband as well. But again, I was so lucky that the company were so inclusive and, you know, um, made sure that he could come with me and facilitated that and everything. So I was just straight back into work. Luckily and fortunately, you know, I'd say if there had been a bigger gap for me, that would have been harder. Whereas I just went straight into it and then just kept going, kept going. We went into rehearsals when he was like 12 weeks and then we were going on tour a couple of weeks later. And then that was it then. We were just kind of working away when he was a little baby and he was coming on tour with us. And that was it. He was a well-traveled little baby at that time. You were breastfeeding him as well, weren't you? Did you find that oh. easy when you were traveling or was it a hindrance? Did you wish he was on the bottle? No, uh, it was it was really handy. And um, the only thing was when I got to Australia, my milk dried up from the flight. Oh, so I just kept trying to kind of drink loads of water and keep feeding and feeding him. And then Peter went and got um formula just as a standby when I was on stage, but we never had to use it. Oh, that's amazing. Good work. Yeah. So that was great. And that was really handy, like, because, you know, I could just, he was coming with me to rehearsals and everything so he could be fed. And then like my mom was great as well, because she'd come to rehearsals and take him off me and go around to my house and mind him and then come back when he needed feed and stuff. So that was really great. That's amazing. Isn't it amazing how moms just do it? Like you just get on with it. You probably look back now and go, how did I do all that? I know. I know. I even remember him being in, like, he's been <laughs> he's been in so many dressing rooms and you know on the boot I love it <laughs> you know so many rehearsal rooms and everything it was it was great like but that's what it should be like and that's what the workplace should be like you know I think there was somebody in one of the there was, was it an interpreter or something in one of the big European Union meetings and she had her baby in the sling on the boob as she was working with her headset doing the live interpreting 
And I remember that hit the news. I remember thinking that's what we need to see is more babies on the boob in the workplace. And especially up to the time they're crawling, they're very portable. They're very quiet because they're kept happy all day long. Totally. It was only when he turned kind of exactly when he started crawling. I was like, okay, it's not possible for him to be and making more noises and just that little bit more kind of getting into things. I was like, it's not possible for, for me to even concentrate now. So we have to come up with an alternative, you know? Yeah, but I love that. And it's really great that your career has that flexibility for mums. If you're able to, I think, swing it. It's not easy, but I think yeah. if, you, if you can dictate this is gonna, this is how it's gonna be, it can really work out yeah. really well. Good on you. Yeah. And then you had your second baby. How did having her affect your work, or if at all, did she just kind of slot in? Yeah, well, she was like a COVID baby. Oh yeah. So because I I didn't think I was gonna really have a second baby. And then, and just because of the juggle, you know, I was like, this is, you know, brilliant. And I find it hard dividing atten my attention anyway. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I can just about manage like my career and having one child. But then when the pandemic hit, I was like, oh, good, like, you know, <laughs> the world's going to end. <laughs> might as well. <laughs> we might as well, you know? Yeah. yeah. So that was kind of during the pandemic and also it made it easier because you did there was no FOMO because no one was working, you know? Yeah. And I remember I went off social media at the time for 11 months. Wow. And, yeah. On purpose. Yeah. I just remember during the pandemic when everyone started doing all these kind of Zoom readings and, you know, just hopping on a Zoom here. And this was all really new. And then there'd be like pictures going up on Instagram and people kind of like, you know, looking like they were busy, even though none of us were able to leave our houses. And I was like, God, I'm not doing any of those Zoom things. And also the year before the pandemic, had been like a really, really brilliant and busy year for me. Like I didn't stop the whole year, you know. So then suddenly it's like dead quiet. It, like no one is working but everyone is on these zoom things and my whole my whole career has kind of come to a halt after this brilliant brilliant 2019 you know um and I just said oh do you know what it's not making me feel good being on this so I just went off it and I only went back on it then after I had the baby I don't think having the second one impacted at the time because there was nothing to really miss out on if you know what I mean yeah. no one was you know I wasn't seeing any peers or um, friends kind of getting big roles because there was none to really be be gotten at that time yeah nothing was really happening it was all kind of like these kind of virtual things or even if there was a play it was like 50 in the audience capacity that type you know that type of thing um it's mad so how yeah. we forget how different the world was now that we're back into the swing of things when you look yeah. back and go, my God, we actually wore masks everywhere and had our yeah. TV radius for a while every year. Yeah. And I remember as well at the time thinking, I'm never going to kind of, like, I want to live at this kind of like country life level of calm. And, you know, and the next thing you're just back in the hustle and the mania and the madness. And, you know, I've got like double double the, the workload now with like two kids and then busier than ever with work and you know it's just funny how you forget you forget that kind of peace we all I know it wasn't peaceful because there was a pandemic going on and people were really ill and dying and stuff but there in our own little bubbles, there was like a peace because we couldn't go out and meet people and you're just yeah I loved that part of it too and I remember all the lovely pictures on social media of like the world healing you know there were more bees and butterflies because there was less pollution and I remember yeah, people were saying the skies were clearer and yeah. with no like, less flights and all that kind of thing yeah so I don't know obviously we were trying to catch up after the pandemic ended we, I think life felt like it was twice speed or maybe it was just compared to how quiet it had been but I feel like we still haven't slowed down into a balance yet. I still feel like we're all still really on a on a hamster wheel, although maybe that's just adult life nowadays as well. Yeah, I definitely think it's a bit of that. I feel that level of like just can't like constantly rushing. <laughs> yeah. And you've got two little ones probably in school or a crash, isn't 
as Judy and yeah um, one is in school and one is about to start preschool in September so so you're up and out every morning yeah there. yeah yeah like it's really really busy and then in, in a great way but it it's there's a lot to kind of a lot going on in the head yeah all the time so how do you juggle this then the mom juggle how do you fit in like your writing or even learning your lines and stuff how do you do that mm-hmm. I used to write at night when Robin was in bed when he was younger. He went to bed at seven o'clock and then I just made myself a cup of tea and sat down at the kitchen and uh, kitchen table and just started writing. And if I was in a flow, that could go until, you know, half 11, 12. And if I wasn't, I'd finish up maybe about half nine, 10. And then when I had the second, then that just wasn't <laughs> possible anymore. I was just too tired, too burnt out, just wasn't possible. Yeah. Kind of a lot of kind of even writing projects kind of went to the back burner um after Judy came along. Uh I couldn't I couldn't find the time, especially if an acting job was coming in, the writing was going out the window and you know, it was always that kind of thing. And as well with writing, it's so self-disciplined that you really just have to make the time. Yeah. Um, so I'm looking that I have a child minder to like two mornings a week. Uh, minimum and then if more work comes in she's brilliant she'll uh she'll she'll take her more and then I have like family support and that my mom is great as well at helping out you know but it's always a juggle because stuff comes in so last minute and you just kind of have to jump and go obviously Barry's in the same industry as you I don't know how you guys do it I could not do that you're literally on the edge living on adrenaline all the time yeah that and that's hard like that can be really hard that kind of settling yourself yeah he read something about the adrenaline an actor gets on stage for a night or maybe even in an audition um is the same amount of adrenaline as you get if you're in a car accident yeah it's coursing through your veins like no wonder so many of the older generations used alcohol to numb themselves after a show like it's probably one of the only ways you get to sleep is if you have a few drinks after yeah. a show. Yeah, totally. I, even I found like I've had a really amazing first half of the year has been just chock-a-block. I have not stopped. And I have just this little break now and I feel like I still can't settle yeah. into it. I'm just still trying to find my feet and get into a new pace and that's hard after every job or after every kind of big thing that you go through, you know? Yeah. T- talk about one more round because we haven't even mentioned that yet and that mm-hmm. deserves to be celebrated. So do you want to tell everybody where it came from, this project, where it went? Yeah. So uh, one more round is an adaptation of the play I was mentioning earlier, um, Split Ends. So when I finished the play, someone said to me you should really adapt that for the screen it would be really good I was like oh maybe so then time went on and I was kind of just working away on on other bits like acting jobs and stuff and then I was like no I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna start writing that so I wrote it I started writing it into a feature film I didn't know how I was gonna write it or what it was gonna be about and then once I kind of found who the character's name is Amy in the the play And she talks about her husband, Darren. And once I had Darren in my head, then I was like, oh, I know what this is about. It's And then I had kind of, Darren was uh, my friend Lloyd Cooney. So then I started kind of writing away and it was about their kind of struggle to conceive a baby and their kind of journey through IVF and all the struggles that come with that. So I wrote two kind of drafts of a feature version of it. And then when I realized it's going to take a long time, to get this made or if it'll ever be made you hear so many things that don't so I was like I have more of a chance of getting this made if I make it a short and I think it could be a cracking little short so then I got Barry your husband on board and I said I'm going to make this feature into a short will you come on board and help that made it really really special because we worked together for so long and I literally did my first ever job with him and we were just crafting and you know he was giving me feedback then I'd go off and write and then we started trying to kind of get people on board to help us make the short we applied to Screen Ireland um for their focus short scheme and long story short we got it so we got to make it and then we shot it in February and Barry was directing for anyone listening 
Um, yeah. What I loved about it, watching it, and I watched some of the shooting as well, which was really exciting and got the kids yeah. got to be extras in it as well. Um, what I loved was it was so grounded and real. Like you could absolutely imagine anyone you know in these situations and these characters. Did you put mm. on real people or were they fictional characters completely? See, I'd I'd heard a lot of stuff. It's it's an amalgamation of everyone, you know. Like Amy is kind of a version of myself. Darren is kind of a version of Lloyd. But the characters themselves are definitely people like an amalgamation of people that I know, you know, um, and the subject matter was something I've always been interested in. I've heard about it, family members that have gone through fertility struggles, friends. So it was just something I was always really curious and interested in and also always thinking oh my god that just must be so difficult and so hard and then the stigma around infertility yeah. is just it's still quite stifling for people that they you know people find it really hard to share that they're going through that Um, it's kind of spoken about in hushed tones so that was always kind of the driving force behind behind the writing and making it as real as possible, like people that we really, really recognised. I didn't have to go through IVF or anything, like to have my children, but <clears throat> we just recently premiered the film there at the Galway Film Fla, and um, a couple of people came up to me and just said, that was well-researched, and I, like, as in, you've obviously, and I was like, no, no, like, and they were like, oh, because that, you know, that, that was what, what I went through but I did I did a lot of interviews with people who had been through it so I kind of knew all the stages of an IVF cycle. What were you most proud of in telling that story? I'm most proud of it being about people like me from where I'm from that it was shot in the area that I'm from Cabra. Yeah. That is about people yeah just ordinary working class people who are going through just a a struggle yeah and you know there's finance like financial struggle in there emotional strain you know all that kind of stuff that's I'm just so proud that I was able to kind of make something about like people like me yeah who, who are like from an area like mine authentically yeah you know Barry's vision and our cinematographer the performances like it just all felt so real like exactly what I wanted yeah not to spoil it but there's a party scene in the film that's like uh, it, it's set at a 30th birthday party in Cabra and I said it has to be exactly like a birthday party in Cabra it can't feel like anything else <laughs> and when I watched it like cuts of the film I was like oh we got it we oh. got it you know that's amazing. I yeah. love I love how you're just able to have a vision and just pursue it. And I know there's things like funding that need to be sorted, but I think if you believe in a project and your passion really shows through, that's going to carry it and everything else should fall into place as long as someone behind it really believes in it. Yeah. I got I won't lie, I was dogged about that. <laughs> yeah. Like the real dogged determination there it was just that just it's just going to happen that's just it yeah. we'll just figure we'll figure out a way but it, that's just so we were lucky to get the the funding and everything but I just had that kind of no matter what I had to do I was like it'll this will get made yeah that's and I think you do need you need that to kind of bring something from your head onto a page to then kind of getting it in front to a you know ages down the line then to eventually getting it to an audience it takes a lot of um a lot of perseverance oh my god yeah and I remember yeah. Barry was so excited to get to direct something and be using real film to be shooting it it wasn't shot on digital so it has that a really different look and feel and it even yeah. meant that your shoot had to be really like pre precisely timed because wasting 
time was wasting money because your film was only to be used once. And also the way Barry directed the film, it was a really, he really made it a very kind of like the set was the actor set. You know, I'd say that would come from probably him being an actor himself. He knows what feels good. Mm -hmm. There was no shouting action or anything like that because that does give you a little jolt on a set like when um, they call action. So it was none of that. It was just in your own time. But also like in your own time, but like also there's film rolling here that's costing money. But that just really, I think, enhanced and helped the actors. Yeah. And it lent itself to these kind of like calm, grounded and really subtle performances, I think, because you almost forgot the camera was there. You feel like you're a fly on the wall in their lives and you feel like some moments are so intimate. Even the sex scene, which I cringe whenever I see a sex scene. Um, on screen you feel like you're just peeking through a door or whatever and overhearing these conversations yeah uh, which is what makes it so gut-wrenching watching them go through this because you care for the people right from the start because you feel like you know them you know yeah tell people to keep an eye on the one more round instagram account will that be the yes. best that's exactly it yeah brilliant and what's next for you you said you have a bit of a break do you enjoy these breaks or are you always thinking to the head to the next thing? That's something I'm getting better at. Trying not to look ahead. <laughs> so always having goals and ambition and, you know, trying to kind of keep different projects on the boil, but not always looking for the next thing. Yeah. I remember being in, like even being in Galway and um, Myself and Barry were spending a lot of time together because we were going to film together and, you know, sharing accommodation and we'd be walking down the road and I'd be like, take, take this moment in, like, because, you know, this is it, like, you know? Yeah, this, this, is, this, yeah, this, this is, is, dream. is it. Like, years ago, you might be thinking, oh, this will lead to this, will lead to this till eventually I get to here. Yeah. But ultimately we are here. We were in Galway, that was here. Yeah. So in terms of sorry, what I'm working on, I've got a couple of writing projects on the boil. I'm writing a play called Mr. Moran that's been commissioned by Bitter Like a Lemon Theatre Company. And we're hoping we'll have that produced in maybe 2026. So I just did a development on that with a bunch of actors and that was incredible. That was the first time I'd, I'd written something and heard it out loud by other actors and I wasn't in it. Oh, wow. Can you give us a sneak clue what it's about? Yeah, it's about, it's basically about a group of work, like a, a working class family who have come back to the family home, um, like a two up, two down terrace, terraced house kind of thing, um, ex-council house type thing. And they've come back in the last few days. They're nursing their sick father upstairs in bed. Aww. So it's about kind of grief family dynamics um, how different people deal with different situations and then also that the way you might deal with one with, with grief might be very different to how another person deals with it and then all the kind of like things that go on within a family when grief comes to the surface that's brilliant so I say it's it's not breaking the mold in terms of what it's talking about but it's specific in terms of the context in that it's about a group of working class women who generally working class women tend to be amazing carers yeah they nurse their sick parents and everyone in the family putting everyone before themselves yeah so I wanted to kind of explore that as a topic oh that sounds gorgeous I find now the last couple of years well the last five years or so less of my friends are having babies and more of them are having elderly parents to look after. And it's so relevant thinking like my parents had me young, so they're still young and fit. They're just, my dad's just turned 70. My mom's still 69. I'm 46 for context, but oh I, have other friends, I have other friends in their fifties who have parents now who are needing round the clock care. And they're dealing with that same issue. The siblings, like who's taking responsibility, who's not pulling their weight. It's, yeah. It's such a tricky situation because it's you can so imagine that every sibling has a different relationship with the parent and feels mm -hmm. a different level of responsibility or willingness to do the caring as well. And yeah. And also like another thing that pops up in this play as well is that 
this kind of thing of we all come from the same house but we didn't get the same upbringing yes so there's no way that I can be the same parent to both of my children I'm just different yeah <laughs> and that's just that and that affects each child differently depending on their makeup depending on what kind of way they are just generally you just can't you can't like there's no blueprint or there's no one size fits all for children and for parents because you know even if you have two children in the it, within a year of each other you're just not going to be the same parent to both of them yeah you're just not yeah. so how that kind of affects the children and also or how it doesn't yeah is is interesting so I'm interested in all of those things I love that. And then I have another film project in the works, but I can't really say too much about that yet. Mm -hmm. um, that, but that's going to be a documentary drama. Excellent. Yeah, a docudrama, yeah. So that's in the works as well. And then I have a play coming up in uh, that I go into rehearsals for in September. Excellent. So you're not writing this, you're just acting in it. Yeah, just performing in it. So I'm really looking forward to that. Can you talk about that, what it's about, where it's on? I don't know if I can. That's okay, don't, don't. <laughs> I don't know if I can. Build some mystique around it. <laughs> well, you, you just never know whether people are waiting to announce things online. No, and all you're that fine. Kind of thing. That's fine. Yeah, this is not the place. We I don't, don't know. know. But we're... that that is the plan. Um, so yeah, just trying to kind of... Are you there? Yeah. I remember the week after the flask. That's really difficult to go, God... After all that, that was it. Yeah. I know. <laughs> and now it's back to normality and, yeah. you know, not that it wasn't beforehand, but just like the dinners and out of the park and, you know, just straight back, straight back into it. The dirty washing and you're like, I shouldn't be here. I should be up on the stage or in the rent. Oh, yeah, yeah. When you finish it. But like all of that stuff still has to keep going, even when you're working anyway, you know, you just have to keep doing it. <laughs> Stuff. Yeah. I'm like I finish it I get a load of washing away and I'm like that's great amazing and then you're like oh my god it's full again how did that happen you know what I've recently done a mental trick on myself I've been like well if the washing basket was empty it would mean my family are all dead and I live alone so then I'm like oh so they're alive so they're they're dirty and clothes because they're alive <laughs> I've had to go that far to reconcile the dirty laundry Oh, it's just relentless. Like all of that stuff, all the kind of the mundane stuff is really relentless, yeah. isn't it? And your age kids are tricky because they're not yet helping out. I'm I remember what my mom used to say, would just not take some initiative? <laughs> and now I'm like, when is going to take some initiative? I know, I know. And I only read recently, apparently that children who do chores have higher self-esteem than children who don't because they feel like they're really contributing to a team so I think my kids have really high self-esteem and they just don't think they need to help out <laughs> I think that end of the skip I know I know it's hard all of those kind of managing all of those things and then trying to juggle the outside like yeah. work as well it really is. And you have to wear two hats. I used to take work calls anytime. You know, if the phone rang, I'd be like, quiet, everyone. And then I'd have to suddenly jump into professional mode. Whereas now I just have my phone on silent all the time. And if someone wants to talk to me, we have to arrange it at least a day in advance. I yeah. Because yeah. things are just too unpredictable, you know? Yeah. And it's just kind of, it, there's just never any switch off then. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I was always going around waiting with the phone ring, you know, and yeah, yeah your head. You can't, really, you can't really settle into anything or really be present in the house then either. Yeah. So now I've I've got a lot better. I know when I'm in work, I'm super productive and I'll bash out a whole day's work in two hours and then I'll be off for the rest mm -hmm. of the day or whatever. Or I'll have scheduled an afternoon of work with a client and Barry will take the kids out if I'm working from home or whatever it is. Yeah. How do you find like the unpredictability of your work? So like the yeah, yeah, just that kind of like you're going from probably like being in the house and being the or CEO of the house and yeah. managing it all, and you're like out, and then you know I would know it's like Peter would have to kind of take over a bit when I'm out, and then you're kind of 
all the roles get a bit muddied then yeah I kind of love it because I love having to get dressed and go and do some really professional work where I look slick and I'm in business mode because that really energizes yeah. me and it gives me such a buzz whereas I find if I'm in if, if, if I'm in a phase where I'm not doing any client work for a while I find I can just get really beaten down by the drudgery of being a housewife and a mom and yeah. that's it and I'm like is this all there is to me so yeah. See, I, I, get, I get so um like invigorated and like buzzed when I go out to you know rehearsal audition rehear yeah anything voiceover come but then when I come home I just find it very hard then to come out of that and get straight back oh. into and I had to think about people who have like nine to fives and they just have to do that every single day whereas my work is just always such bursts of work for a few weeks and you're just in kind of you know keeping your head above water for those weeks and then you're back into uh, yeah and your work yeah. you're on and people are looking at you and listening to you for your work whereas somebody in a nine to five might be hiding behind a computer screen six hours of the day and they might just have a couple of meetings so I think what the work you do you're being perceived all day long and people are looking at you and you're having to really it's, it's like that performance thing you're getting that adrenaline buzz from your work whereas I yeah. think the nine to five it tends to be very low-key kind of work where it's more collaborative they're working with a group nobody's really expecting too much of just them on their own so I yeah. don't think they have the same high levels of cortisol maybe but I was thinking I wonder if I just did this like three six five <laughs> would I just be you know just come home in the evening and be you know because I'm like how does everyone else do it That's yeah like... a lot of them drink in the evenings if we're honest a lot of my clients have an alcohol habit with their dinner and that's fine nobody's judging an adult for having a glass of wine or two in the evenings um, and then others just burn out regularly or else they're just fit for nothing at the weekends you know mm -hmm. So it depends what the day job requires and it depends on the level of support from their partner if they have one at home, if they're chipping in with the kids. But there are people who are basically like doing the work of a stay-at-home mom and doing a full-time job outside of the house as well because their partner does nothing with the kids. So right. it's very different for everyone. And the burden of all the mental loads still seems to fall to the women even in the younger generations, you know, even in the early 30 year olds. Oh uh, yeah, you can really see that like. Yeah, so I love it when I go out and I'm working and then, but I do find when I come back, I'm good for nothing that evening. Like I won't be cooking dinner after a day with a client. I'll just be zonked out or I'll be asleep in bed from 7 p.m. <laughs> because it takes that much out of me, especially yeah. with travel involved. I find travel really tricky as well at the moment. So, I mean, I do it because I love going to like regional offices. Last year, I got to fly to Kerry to do a talk for Met Erin, which was lovely. And yeah. I rented a car and I was just like, yay, here I am with my briefcase in my rental car, getting off the plane, going to do my talk. And I was like, this is what I love about my job. But then I might come home and I might need two days recovery after that. So like Barry's having to do the meals and the childcare and the laundry and everything. Yeah. It's kind of good that we've both been freelance most of the time. So we have a pretty even sharing of the workload. Plus our kids are homeschooled. So we don't have extracurriculars or lunches to make or uniforms to wash. We can have very easy days in our pajamas if we're all feeling tired or sick. So yeah, kind of set it up that way that it's a very low demand lifestyle, which suits us both, I think. Yeah, yeah. Are so high intensity when they are, when they are happening. When they are on. Yeah, but it's different for everyone because some people would go mental at home with their kids and partner all day, every day. Everyone's set up is so different. Yeah. I crave routine. Yeah. I would hate to think that I was going to spend all my days for the next 10 years in the one office with the same light and lamp and window and view. I couldn't do that. But I do like to know where I will be every night and what I'll be having for dinner or lunch most days. So I've got a lot of things on repeat. But with yeah. A lot of room for spontaneity in terms of what I do in the day but kind of my meals and my habits are pretty much routine yeah you have all your like little kind of anchors throughout your day yeah have to have that yeah that's what I love about the gym that's my I do that uh, three days a week so I'm like if I don't go at half six in the morning there's a chance that it just won't happen so I just have to do it before everyone wakes that's amazing <laughs> that is uh 
habit that I just don't think I could be without now. Yeah. There's just such a sense of achievement. I feel like it's bled into kind of every area of my life since I've started doing it. Yeah. I read this book, um, Atomic Habits. Did you hear about, did you hear about that book? Yeah, very good. Yeah. And it was just that thing of like making a habit that you don't even have to think about. So it was set the gym gear out over the banisters that night. When the alarm goes off, don't think about it, just get up. And by the time I had done it three or four times, the first day was really painful. And then as I did it maybe three or four times, next thing I was just doing it. I just get up and sometimes I'd have to like shine the light of the phone in my face to just wake me up a little bit. And then <laughs> and then straight out, out and I don't even think about it, just brush the teeth, clothes on. And I've got everything waiting at the, the hall table. And it only takes me about five minutes to do it all the night before. So it's just an atomic habit as I'm going to bed. I love that. So come here, where can people find you? Um, I'm, on, I'm on Instagram. Lauren Larkin 10, I think is my handle. Uh-huh. I think. Um, and yeah, you'll find me there. And can we finish up with uh, the questions I ask everyone just to wrap it up? Okay. Was there a book or movie that made a big impression on you? Maybe when you were younger? A film that made a big impression on me, and it wasn't when I was younger. It was when I was a little bit older. Was um, Michael Inside by Frank Berry. It's an Irish film. One of my favourite Irish films. Um, And it's about this young guy who gets kind of caught up in the prison system from a young age and it shows you kind of just how easily it can happen and it's just really it's a really excellent film and executed so well and I think when I watched that film I kind of went I want to make films like that I want to be in films like that that's and there's a real social comment Um, and I just think Frank Berry is a brilliant filmmaker he's a yeah he's a real inspiration for me so that film has had a big a big um, influence and impact on me frank berry definitely ken loach their films oh deadly okay yeah. and what's your favorite meal if you had to maybe pick one meal to eat over and over for the rest of your life what would it be bag paneer i think oh yum yeah. well like bag paneer i wouldn't make it myself now you'd be getting it from the indian shop so <laughs> take away. for anyone not familiar with sag paneer it's paneer is a kind of indian cheese isn't it yes and then it's like lovely loads of spinach and spices and everything like that and then i'd have it with lovely pillow rice and naan bread and everything but that's like a that's like like a luxurious treat meal like that's my favorite favorite but if it was just a, a meal that i had to make it would be like a chili oh lovely couple of questions do you have a motto for life I think my motto for life is it's kind of cheesy and cliche but just trying to live in the now and appreciate what you have now rather than looking at tomorrow and what you don't have don't have and that leads us on to our final question what is your idea of perfect happiness if it exists at all I know this I think perfect happiness is I feel like there's always, you know, you always feel like you're dropping balls. So, you know, if something's going really well, you feel like you're failing in another aspect or you, you know, it's always like that, that, that kind of thing of I'm doing really well here, but oh, I think I'm after, I'm after taking my foot off the gas here. So I think just trying to kind of develop some sort of equilibrium and just trying to keep everything on a balance. Yeah, on some sort of balance is the key to happiness, although I don't think there is total and utter happiness I agree all all you can do is just kind of on the previous point that I was talking about of just trying to enjoy the moment that you're in because there's always going to be shit to deal with isn't there (laughs) yeah (laughs) like there's always going to be something like on your happiest moment there's something sad happening too exactly like in those family photos you see on Instagram four out of the five people might be smiling but maybe the baby's screaming at your legs and you're throwing a yeah. smile on your face because you've brought the whole family to Disneyland <laughs> or something yeah yeah exactly or you could be you know you see people and they're having their big moment but like their parent is really ill or you you know it's just like there's always a double-edged sword to to happiness totally we have less than a minute left so we'll have to end yeah. it up there thank you so much for chatting to me today Lauren Thanks for having me. it was a lovely chat
Thank you. Thanks a million. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thanks for tuning in. Don't forget to follow Lauren on Instagram. We'd love a five star rating if you're enjoying this podcast. You're invited to join my new Inner Circle Members Club for all genders and neurotypes, which has a monthly Zoom for personal development, growth mindset and learning to love ourselves more. This is your chance for a glow up or to set some personal goals. All the info's in the show notes. Catch you again soon.